We'll now recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is uh, a privilege to reply on behalf of our party to the speech from the throne that was presented by the government last Thursday. Now, the, the word reply covers a certain amount of ground. It's got some, some different meanings. On the one hand, it means reply as in respond, uh, as in the back and forth that you would have in a conversation. But the word reply also means at the same time to contradict or to reply in the sense of offering a, a retort or a rejoinder. In this sense, it is sometimes said when we talk about a reply, it means to give answer. And this is the sense of the word reply uh, that I want to use this afternoon. It is in that sense a privilege to, to reply, that is to give answer to a range of the counterfactual and vacuous positions that make up the government's point of view as we have seen it expressed and articulated in this throne speech. I want to give answer first to the contention in the speech that it is appropriate in any way to use the word opportunity, as this government uh, in fact is using that word in that speech, to describe the dirty work of June 25th, Black Monday for health care in Cape Breton. June 25th, the announcement Order, of the... I'd like to remind the honourable member uh, that uh, the phrase dirty work would be a unparliamentary term. The honourable leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't aware of that. I'll retract the term. Uh, the, uh, that, that Black Monday for health care in Cape Breton, the announcement of the closure of the Northside General and the new Waterford Consolidated Hospitals, uh, and the emergency facilities that are contained there, uh, that to use the word to describe that, as the throne speech does, as an opportunity for people is something to which, in my view, a, a person ought to give answer. And the answer I wish to give is this, is to say that the government's apparent extraordinary disrespect for the healthcare community and the community as a whole of the CBRM in making uh, this announcement as they did was, in my judgment, hurtful and duplicitous and insulting. Where was the community dialogue? Where was any local conversation? There was no dialogue. There was no conversation. Professor Tom Urbaniak of CBU has spoken about this, I think, uh, very clearly. But I want to quote from his analysis, which I will table. Mr. Urbaniak writes, we we never had an organized public dialogue and local process about how to meet the health objectives or benchmarks that we are trying to attain. We as Cape Bretoners never dissected the different options and studied their impact as a community. Instead, the Premier flew in with a few hours' notice, assured us he knew best, and then departed. End quote. Urbaniak's not kidding when he says a, quote, few hours. Dr. Craig Stone, staff anesthesiologist for the CBRM hospitals, who has provided such important leadership in the health care crisis in Cape Breton, received an invitation to that announcement at 8.30 that morning without any inkling prior of what was to be taking place. Dr. Abdul Atia was in the same situation. They both arrived in scrubs. Dr. Margaret Fraser, president of the Cape Breton Medical Staff Association, said, we were essentially blindsided. I will table her remarks. I asked the Premier on Friday if this conduct 
met the standard of respect for communities and the standard of respect for the medical community that he sets for this government. And he indicated that it did. Lord, help us. How could the government have possibly learned so little? Every rally about the health care crisis in Cape Breton, and there have been a lot of them, every town hall, every march, every gathering in front of a hospital or in a high school, every one of those has had at its core one consistently articulated message, namely, don't impose on us, work with us. Don't dictate, listen, consult with, pay attention to, communicate with the people who are doing the work already, who are deeply, clinically acquainted with what's needed. And what happens? The Premier blows in on Black Monday with the 350,000 a year CEO of the Health Authority, a couple others, and the MLAs for Glace Bay and Sydney Whitney Pier, and unilaterally saws the legs off the hospitals and the emergency services in New Waterford and North Sydney. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words, and in this case, maybe it's worth two thousand. Cape Bretoners are familiar with the picture that appeared on the front page of the Cape Breton Post the next morning. I'm going to table it. Uh, this is a picture on the top part of the front page of the paper that morning of the row of those who had come uh, to make the announcement of what the government calls this opportunity for Cape Breton. And in the row of the picture, there, there are, at, down at the end, the two CBRM Liberal MLAs with their eyes averted, heads hung, hands folded on their haunches, looking for all the world like boys uh, outside the principal's office having received a, a punishment that they totally deserved. Look, look I, I'm a minister. I spent most Order. of my working life. Order. The, the leader of the NDP party is in the speaker, is speaking. Uh, I, I can't avoid the, a sense, Lord, I look at that picture, that this is a, a picture of public officials who at some kind of a level have some kind of an awareness that they have been involved in the people that they re represent having been somehow disrespected. I think it also disrespectful that the government should have insulted the intelligence of the people affected by this decision with some of the arguments that have been put forward for the hospital closures. Oh, shocking revelation. The facilities are older and in need of infrastructural capital investment. So when your car needs brakes and a muffler, do you junk it and tear up the driveway? <laughs> or try this for a piece of logical wonderment. We can't keep the emergency rooms reliably opened, so we have to close them. What? If I, if I went to the doctor with a broken arm and she told me that she was going to enroll me post haste in the palliative care program, I would be concerned about the quality of the care that I was receiving. So there are problems. There are challenges. There are difficulties, plainly, with the staffing of emergency rooms. But problems, difficulties, challenges, those call for solutions and answers and treatments, not for the termination of the patient. Particularly disrespectful, in my judgment, is the intimation that it is unnecessary and anachronistic to have four hospitals with four emergency rooms in the CBRM. To begin with, it is a profound misunderstanding to think, and Tom Urbaniak has also pointed this out, that geographic proximity means inherent duplication. It doesn't, which is why in Toronto they've got over 40 hospitals. But further, 
and more nefariously, let me say clearly that there is only one point of view from which North Sydney, Sydney, New Waterford and Glace Bay appear to be more or less all the same place, and that is the point of view of Halifax, the place to which this government has moved all education decisions with the centralizing of the school board, uh, the place to which the government has moved all health decisions with the centralizing of the health authorities, and to which the government uh, uh, has failed to see, from which the government has failed to see that uh, the Nova Scotia is not well served by the liberal ideology of gathering up everything and centralizing everything that moves. It's disrespectful, and in my view, it is disgraceful that the plan to close the New Waterford and North Sydney hospitals should be proceeding without a glimmer of an answer to the question of how people without vehicles in the context of the existing CBRM transit system, by which you cannot even get directly from New Waterford to Glace Bay, by the way, how, how people without vehicles are supposed to going to be able to get to hospitals from which their home is now going to be separated by a 40, 45, $50 taxi trip round trip. It's disgraceful that the Black Monday plan should be proceeding without a glimmer of an answer to the question of where the 271 people who work at the Northside General and the 123 people who work at the New Waterford Hospital are supposed to go now to look for jobs. One thinks of Professor Lachlan McKinnon, who has newly taken up a position uh, in the Department of History at CBU, and whose specialty is the study of the impacts on communities of deindustrialization. Uh, and in the course of Dr. McKinnon's studies, there is a common word he uses, a kind of central concept of his work, and it is the concept, the word ruination. What a profound betrayal to visit this level of ruination upon this many people and then have the gall to spin it, to market it, to PR it back to those very people as what the government calls and imagine an opportunity. Uh, for those people, for their health care. So I want to give answer to this, Madam Speaker, and I want to give answer also to the government's contention that the long-term care sector is so unproblematic and so devoid of pressing issues that the long-term care, care sector doesn't even merit uh, mention in the throne speech. There, there are so many things that could have been said, that could have been announced in the throne speech on the subject of long-term care, which would have marked the beginning of this session of the House as a real reset, and which could have marked this throne speech as other than a collection of the platitudinous, which is really what it is. The speech from the throne could have said, for example, something like this, my government recognizes the pressure that the long-term care sector has been under as a result of the $5 million reduction in funding over the last four years. My government has heard the concerns of arbitrator, administrators, employees, residents, and families in the sector. And in this upcoming session, the entirety of these funding restrictions will be restored. The throne speech could have said that, a, a government which was competently knowledgeable and effectively concerned about the long-term care sector might well have done this in the throne speech. This government, however, on the subject of long-term care, so paramount in so many people's minds, has here given us not one single word. No one ought to minimize the impact of the cuts uh, to the long-term care sector uh, as has been being done by the governing Liberals. Nursing home administrators certainly don't minimize it. One thinks of the, the deep frustration which was expressed this spring in a letter to the families of residents of the R.K. McDonald nursing home in Antigonish, whose management in that letter spoke about how, although every other avenue had been explored, in the context of those two years of budget cuts, management said in the letter to the families, the R.K. had no alternative but, with regret, to lay off continuing care assistance. Administrators don't minimize the impact of the cuts in nursing homes, nursing homes and neither do uh, people who work in nursing homes minimize the impact of those cuts. All MLAs in the course of their work 
uh, receive uh, delegations uh, from people bringing forward various points of view and various points of uh, experience they have had. Of all the delegations who have come to see me as an MLA, none has moved me more than a delegation of nursing home employees uh, that came last year from across the province. Uh, mostly these were people who worked in dietary services, in laundry services, and in environmental services, in cleaning. And they, they came to Halifax to make public officials aware of how living conditions for residents in the institutions where they worked had been deteriorating since the onset of the cuts. 20, 25, even 30 plus year uh, nursing home employees spoke that morning about uh, how uh, for them, uh, before the cuts, working short was an occasional experience, something that you would have to deal with just from time to time, but that since the cuts, working short had become a regular part of the experience of their work. With observable negative impacts on the tenor and the morale of the home where they worked. One woman's testimony has stayed with me uh, particularly sharply. She spoke about how prior to the cuts, as a cleaner uh, for a couple of decades, she had never ever had the experience of coming to the central stores of the facility and finding that there were no supplies uh, to do her work. But that, she said, since the cuts, cleaning work in her institution had had to be discontinued a number of times mid-shift just because there was nothing for her and the colleagues in her department in the stores for them to work with. So people who work in nursing homes don't share the minimization of the impact of the cuts that the throne speech shows. Uh, administrators in long-term care don't share the minimization of the significance of the cuts in long-term care that the throne speech show. And families of people who live in long-term care do not minimize the impact of these cuts. Over the summer, as a number of cases of questionable uh, care resulting in bed sores became a subject of public discussion and concern, Dr. Jeannie Ferguson of Families for Quality Elder Care and a geriatric psychiatrist was asked to comment. I'll table her remarks to the Chronicle Herald from the 28th of April. She said, nursing homes have done excellent work, but they haven't had a staffing increase in 14 years. And in addition, they had a 1% cut in their budgets in each of the last two years. One looks in vain through the speech from the throne for any, even the most minimal addressing of any of the levels of this crisis. Similarly, the speech from the throne might have said something like this. My government has heard the cries for investments in new long-term care facilities. And over the course of our continuing mandate, the shortfall of new nursing home places of recent years is going to be redressed. The impact of the government's failure, Madam Speaker, to invest in new long-term care places is being felt across the span of the health care system. I was pleased to meet with the paramedics union early last month, just before their release of startling statistics about frequent shortages of available ambulances around the province. The paramedics spoke with detail, as they did uh, in their release on this subject, and they spoke with precision about how delays in offloading patients at hospitals are backing up the system and causing burnout amongst paramedics who are often then required to work long back-to-back -back shifts as the system tries to catch up from the number of hours in which its personnel stand by in emergency rooms. And when the discussion I was having with the paramedics about the figures they were about to reveal on this subject turned to what they would propose to remedy this situation, at the top of the paramedics list was investing in more long-term care beds. And the reason that was at the top of the list is that that would alleviate 
the inability at present of emergency rooms to discharge patients to the general hospital population, an ability which is rooted in the fact that the hospital is so chronically filled with people who are only there for the reason that they are waiting, waiting, waiting for placement somewhere in a nursing home. Now, the facts of this matter are meriting of attention. 21% of the hospital places in all of Nova Scotia are occupied by people who are not hospital patients, uh, but who are rather staying in the hospital, they uh, hope temporarily, uh, while they wait for placement in a long-term care uh, facility. The figure is greater than 21% in considerable parts of the province. It's 30% in the western zone, it's 30% in the northern zone of the NSHA. Consider this fact, that over the last five years, 2,281 people in Nova Scotia waited in hospital for long-term care between 91 and 365 days, and 15% of those people passed away before the awaited place in a nursing home came open. But none of this merits a, a, a little nod None of this merits a half a, a breath. None of this merits any indication in the government's program as it is put before us in this throne speech. Nor is there a nod or a breath or an indication uh, about the need to consider building new nursing homes or to consider reversing those funding cuts uh, in the parameters that were set out last week for the uh, expert panel appointed by the government of the province. And yet we know that every credible voice in health care policy anywhere speaks about how all of these matters are, we need to understand first and foremost about them, they're deeply related. They're all deeply integrated. That's the first thing that policy people speak about when you ask them about the nature of the present crisis and what road you need to go. They, they say, well, the first thing you got to understand, it's all connected. It's all integrated. It's all entirely of a piece. So I think it's important to give answer to the entire absence, uh, to the complete silence in the speech from the throne about the continuing and deepening crisis in Nova Scotia in the world of long-term care. And I most certainly also want to give answer, in addition to the, the subjects of uh, the Cape Breton hospitals and the long-term care, I, I want also to give answer to the contention in this speech from the throne that the government's work in the area of poverty reduction, the contention that in any way it merits the tone of self-satisfied self-congratulation that is put forward with here in this document. Because on the contrary, in the judgment of our party, the thing that would be appropriate for the government's work on poverty reduction would be more a tone of humility, be more a tone of a quiet acknowledgement of not having got really very far. That would be more appropriate. That would be more fitting. I attended a, a striking event in July, the opening of Feed Nova Scotia's new facility in Burnside. I was there with the member for Dartmouth South and the member for Dartmouth North, um, and we were pleased to, to meet there also the member for Dartmouth East. By my memory, I don't recall there being any members of the government present there, uh, but at that event, they did an, they, uh, an interesting thing. Uh, the, the new warehouses uh, facilities are much larger than the old ones. And so that the guests at the opening for the new facilities of Feed Nova Scotia, so that they could grasp this, the, uh, the people from Feed Nova Scotia marked out and traced out the space, the, the, the dimensions, of the former facility on the floor of the new warehouse floor. And then the, the ceremony to open the new warehouse, that was held within this marked out space. And the effect was that because they had the seats for the ceremony uh, within the marked out space, the effect was that you had to walk, step over the line into this space uh, in order to sit down when the ceremony was going to be held. And in addition to the marking they had on the space, the Feed Nova Scotia had also placed a series of about two or three foot high uh, infographics along that border uh, depicting uh, the 
character of the situation of hunger and poverty in Nova Scotia. And the result was that if you were going to go in and sit in the chairs where the ceremony was held, you had to walk by uh, and, and register at some level uh, the information that was contained in those infographics. Here's the information. Infographic one. One in six households in Nova Scotia is food insecure, which means lacks adequate food because of money conditions. Infographic two. Nova Scotia has the highest rate of food insecurity of any province in Canada. Infographic three. 41,000 people had to receive their food from a food bank in 2017 in Nova Scotia. Let me say, in these opening days of this session, which could well take us into the sixth year into which these Liberals have be, been the government of our province, I want to say that this is an unconscionable scandal for which the responsibility rests squarely with this government. No amount of condescending pronunciation of the word transformation no amount of self-aggrandizing, breast-beating about the $28 income assistance increase of 2016, none of this changes one particle, the fact that the primary authors of the scandal of hunger in our province on September 11, 2018 are the Liberal government of Nova Scotia. And let's just pause a moment to consider that $20 increase in income assistance from the 2016-17 budget, about which the government does so much unseemly bragging. The truth is that there had been no increase, zero, in the two Liberal years before that, and there have been no zero increases since. This government does not have a poverty reduction strategy, they have a strategy for producing poverty-related spin. And let's compare that record, for example, with the record of the government of the New Democratic Party elected last year in British Columbia, which in its first act, other than a, a thing that had to be done immediately in connection with the wildfire that was taking place at the time, with, with the exception of what they had to do about that wildfire, in its very first act brought in a monthly increase in social assistance in BC of $100. Now, I don't diminish in any way the, the significance of such income supporting measures as are in fact mentioned in the throne speech, whether these have to do with bus passes or uh, personal allowances for people who don't have a home or the treatment of earned income relative to a person's check. I do, however, think it is important for these uh, matters to be placed in perspective and looked at in proportion placed in perspective and proportion relative not just to the depth of the problem, but also to the wider scope the bigger seriousness, the more really dealing with the matter that we see in jurisdictions elsewhere, in comparison to which, when we compare ourselves to that $100 bought on day one of that new government, in comparison to which what has been delivered on this subject by the Liberal government of Nova Scotia can't be described as other than a pittance and very paltry. And on the subject of keeping things in proportion and thinking about uh, uh, comparatively about our position in the rest of the country, I also don't want to overlook the fact that in the course of this current session, it is very likely with the scheduled change to take place in Saskatchewan in the minimum wage on October 1st, it is very likely that in the course of this session, in about three weeks, Nova Scotia is to become, we are on a pace to, become the province with the worst minimum wage in our whole country. And this is going to happen on precisely the day, October 1st, that in Alberta, the three-year march towards $15 is going to be completed. And this is happening in a context across our country, a context in which a commitment to $15 has been made in BC, in which Ontario has made the move uh, to $14. Uh, and it's also in a, in a context in which, while we're in the comparison with the rest of the country business, it's a context in which we have the third highest paid premier in the country, and we have the only premier in Atlantic Canada that the people of their province are paying more than $200,000. So I want to give answer to the thought that any of this is acceptable. And I, and I, and I, want, to, I want to say that it is unacceptable, uh, and it is contemptible, and it is a scandal. And there is much more that, if, if time uh, permitted, 
I would wish to give answer in this throne speech. A great deal of effort is made by the government in the throne speech to associate itself with the successes of young people in the province. And I want to give answer to the fact that in the course of this, the government fails entirely to acknowledge the enormous burden it continues to lay on the young people of the province uh, by continuing the situation in which we have the fastest rising tuition in the country. The throne speech uses the word, uh, it speaks about how young people are showing, this is actually the word that's there, how young people of the province are showing courage. Well, I think it takes courage to look towards Ontario where uh, if your household's making less than $50,000 a year, your tuition at an Ontario facility is paid by the public of the province. It takes courage then to look at, at New Brunswick where uh, if your household's making less than $60,000, your tuition is paid uh, uh, at a New Brunswick institution by the public of the province. Or, or to look to Newfoundland and Labrador where tuition is just slightly over $2,600. Or to look to Quebec uh, where it's just a little bit more than that. And, and then to look back at Nova Scotia, it takes courage to stomach and take in that here in our province, average tuition is 7726 All of this deserves to be given answer, but more than anything else, I, I want to give answer now to the, to the core outlook which defines the Liberal enterprise in Nova Scotia, and which in my view is exposed in its unworthiness in this throne speech. And that is that, that all of this as it has been presented is as good as we can in our province at this moment hope for. It's not a crime, you know, to have written a bad speech. Most uh, public figures, certainly myself included, would have done that a, a time or two. It is, however, precisely a crime to be entrusted with the governance, to be entrusted with the leadership of people in a time of sharp and pressing felt need, and then to offer no ideas, to offer no goals, to offer no program. I reject the idea that what we see in this throne speech is a government that is building itself on incrementalism. This is not incrementalism. This is nothingism. And why? Because this government lives entirely under the umbrella, is completely under the sway uh, of one core now discredited and erroneous idea, namely, that we ought not to aim for anything except as can be accomplished within the limits of an annually balanced budget. This throne speech is a starkly clear measure of precisely where this stale dated Thatcherism gets us. The government is going to, says there, the government is going to what? Oh, it's going to bring in a, a traffic safety act. Well, yeah, right? Good. Uh, and, well, the government is going to make it uh, cheaper to incorporate a company. Well, yeah, good, right? And, and, uh, well, you mean that's, that's kind of it? That's your program? You're moving into year six, and that's what you're bringing? It's a bag of zeros in a, in a box of hubris. And every one of these areas of failure that is brought uh, into view by the thinness of this throne speech is the result of concrete choices which have been and are now being made by the Liberal government of Nova Scotia. We do not have the appropriate amount of nursing homes in Nova Scotia because the Liberal government has decided it is a higher priority to have a budget surplus. The nursing homes we do have are not adequately funded because the Liberal government has decided that it is a higher priority to have a budget surplus. One in five of our children, one in three in significant regions of the province lives in poverty because the Liberal government has made the decision that it is a greater priority, it is of higher priority, it is in a larger place uh, to have a budget surplus. People every day overcome with anxiety, people overcome with depression, arrive for help at our public mental health services and receive appointments in four, six, eight, ten, sometimes 12 months time. Why does this happen? 
It's a solvable problem. It happens because the Liberal government has made a decision that it is more important than delivering those timely services that we should have in Nova Scotia a balanced budget. Young people are unable in our province to establish themselves in the world because the burden is sitting on them so heavily of educational debt. Why is that? It's because the Liberal government, now moving into its sixth year, has made a decision that that might not be a good thing, but it is not as important, the solution to it, as producing a budget surplus uh, for the province. Uh, these are wrong decisions. These are wrong decisions which are rejected now by such a growing chorus of people. Wrong decisions rejected by a growing chorus of economists, of authors, of commentators, of, of uh, jurisdictions going in a different direction, of leaders in our province, of leaders in different communities, all of whom understand the exciting and the hope-filled doors that can be opened when governments stop worshipping their surpluses and invest instead seriously in the needs and the futures of their people. Let it be stated absolutely clearly. We don't have to have a health care system that is broken at the level of primary care, emergency care, long-term care, and any other kind of care that you might care to mention. We don't have to have communities whose efforts to attract new people and retain and bring home their own are undermined by emergency rooms that are closed as often as they're open. We don't have to be at the bottom. The province with the highest proportion of their population who can't afford to buy their groceries. The province with the lowest minimum wage. The province with the most unrepayable levels of tuition. I think of a, a marvelous song by the British indie rock band Florence and the Machine. It's, it's on a terrifically titled album. The album's called High as Hope. And the name of the song is We All Have a Hunger. We all have a hunger for something profoundly better. And make no mistake, it is absolutely coming. The arc of history holds that promise. But first, we have to take all of this false and self-flattering failure and move it to one side. And we're at that, Madam Speaker. Thank you.